Hello, everyone. Uh, so for my case study, I chose to write about the rise and fall of Blockbuster. Uh, throughout the semester, this topic has come up a couple times, and I just always found it really interesting. Uh, you know, we can all remember as a young kid, uh, you know, swifting through the rows in Blockbuster, picking out a favorite movie uh, with family and friends for a good Friday night. Um, however, as we will get into, um, ultimately Blockbuster had to file for bankruptcy and all retail locations closed. So first, I think it's important to start with uh, kind of an introduction of the movie rental industry and why it started and kind of how that led to the founding of Blockbuster. So in the 80s, uh, video cassette video cassette recorders, um, you know, had become a notorious household item as popular movie studios had begun to sell movies. Uh, directly to customers. However, um, at the time, kind of cost to purchase movies um, was nearly, you know, ranged from $75 to $100, uh, where the medium household income was only $21,000. So this really just wasn't a possible option for um, kind of the nation as a whole. Uh, consumers could not afford um, to purchase movies on their own. So kind of therefore, this is when uh, local mom and pop shops opened, uh, movie rental shops opened uh, where customers could rent a movie rather than purchasing them. So then, uh, so the story of Blockbuster and the founding. So again, local mom and pop shops began to pop up um, and David Cook um, kind of saw this opportunity uh, to build something new. So Blockbuster was founded in 1985 by Texas uh, oil and gas software engineer, David Cook. Um, and he opened his first store in Dallas, Texas. Uh, he sought out for the mission of Blockbuster to be to become the global leader in uh, rentable entertainment by providing outstanding service, selection, convenience, and value. And where Blockbuster really differentiated from uh, local mom and pop stores was they had a larger and diverse selection of movies, you know, from horror to comedy to drama. Um, romance movies, uh, Blockbuster had it all. They had longer hours of operations, uh, staying open till some retail locations open till midnight. So, you know, late night, Friday night, you decide you wanted to go rent a movie at 10 o'clock, you could go do so at Blockbuster. Uh, they were family friendly as well, uh, offering a wide selection of kids' movies. Um, so, again, there was a movie for everyone at the store. And a big differentiator. Um, was at the local mom and pop stores, movies were often kept behind the counters. Um, but at Blockbusters, I'm sure we all remember, uh, movies were out where customers could touch, see them, read the descriptions, uh, see the cover, um, and really help make their selection, kind of enhance the overall experience of going to the store. So what was Blockbusters' competitive strategy and kind of how did they knock out all local mom and pop stores? First, it was their low movie acquisition cost. Uh, Blockbuster would pay between $2 to $5 uh, to purchase exclusive new release movies um, from studios. Um, and then they had rental, um, rental share revenue deals uh, with the movie studios where whatever, uh, you know, however much they made from a certain movie, they would pay that back to the movie studio. So this was really a mutually beneficial relationship for both Blockbuster and the movie studio. Uh, your first day of rental for, was $2.99 for new releases and $1.99 for older films. So again, this was a much, uh, the price point for renting movies um, was much more attainable rather than spending $100 to purchase the movie outright. Uh, another big um, kind of differentiator, what led Blockbusters, what led to Blockbuster success was again with Cook's background in engineering. He was able to develop innovative data information processing systems, as you can see in the computer or in the picture, the computer screens um, kind of show what that looked like at the time. With this, um, employees were able to streamline the movie check in and out process, and they were efficiently able to manage their inventory, what they had in the stores, what they did not. Uh, this model was very easily replicated, uh, so therefore Blockbuster um, you know, at the peak of their success, they were opening a new store or one new store per day um, and just continuing to grow and expand uh, this organization and Blockbuster as a company. Now, what really um, kind of have what their competitive advantage, advantage was, was their late fee penalty. Uh, because of their diverse selection, their ability to acquire new release films quickly, they knew they had to find a way to keep them on the shelves to keep customers coming back. Um, kind of keep that revenue up. So they charged $2.99 for every day late for new releases, $1 late for every 
uh, for, you know, they're categorized as favorites movies, $4.99 um, every day late for video games. And with this, this generated over $800 million um, or 16% of their revenue. And this really was their main revenue streamline was these, were these late penalty fees. However, um, we then have the emergence of Netflix. Um, really as a uh, competitor, um, direct competitor to Blockbuster. So in 1997, Reed Hastings and Mark Randolph, um, out of frustration from a $40 Blockbuster late fee, founded Netflix. Excuse me, Netflix started as a, a Reed and Hastings wanted to develop a service similar to Amazon, where customers could purchase a product online and receive it by mail. And their first model started with uh, DVD by mail. It was a flat rate of $4 per movie, a $2 shipping and handling fee, and there were no late fees. But you could not rent another movie until you had returned the one you had rented. They then switched to a subscription plan, uh, kind of saw that there was proof of concept and they had a growing uh, customer base. And so they switched to a $15.95 subscription based model um, where you can rent a limited amount of movies um, at any time just by paying $15.95 um, a month. A big, uh, something I'll kind of talk about uh, throughout the presentation um, is Netflix algor algorithm data tracking system. Um, this really was what set Netflix apart and kind of led to their success was um, IT was able to monitor and track what movies uh, their viewers and customers were watching and renting um, and really targeted and to or really put more movies, uh, you know, similar, uh, you know, if we were watching a lot of horror movies, if we were watching a lot of drama, um, uploaded and put more um, of those type of movies to attract more customers. Now in 2007, uh, Netflix shifted to the streaming model. Um, they were able to license streamed movies um, directly on their website. Uh, people could watch movies from the comfort of their own home immediately. Um, and with this, they had over 130 million worldwide subscribers. Um, however, streaming licensed movies um, did come at a cost um, and kind of go back to that algorithm data. Um, they had that data available. They had that information. They knew what their viewers liked or they knew what their customers wanted to see. So they decided to uh, push or create um, original content that was specifically targeted around the customer base. Uh, they debuted with uh, the political series House of Cards, um, and by 2018, they had over thousands um, of original TV and movie um, content. With this, it attracted an additional 8.3 million subscribers, again, because these movies, TV shows were directly targeted to what their customers were wanting, what they were viewing. In 2016, um, Netflix was a global company, but in 2016, they took additional efforts um, to go global. They uh, made agreements with cellular, cellular and cable network, oh my gosh, networks um, around the world to bundle Netflix into their cable or cellular plan um, so their customers would have access to that through um, various plans um, across the world. With this, that then attracted another 300 million subscribers worldwide. Um, so at this point, um, Netflix was really at its peak or you know, growing towards its peak and Blockbuster knew that they had to innovate um, for the sake of this presentation, it was hard for me to find, um, you know, kind of where to fit this detail. But prior um, to Netflix becoming what it did, they did offer to buy um, Blockbuster and kind of innovate their systems. Netflix saw that things were going more technical, more online, um, but Blockbuster really, uh, they declined the offer. Um, their CEOs, analysts really, uh, you know, for lack of better words, saw Netflix as a joke. Uh, really failed a plan for the future, planned to see those technological innovations that were being made um, and ultimately declined this offer. You know what, at the time, Netflix saw as a setback really uh, became their biggest advantage um, from not partnering, uh, buying Blockbuster. So what did Blockbuster do to attempt to innovate? Uh, they saw Netflix um, was a direct competitor to them and knew they had to pivot their business model um, in order to stay afloat, to stay alive. Um, so in 2004, Blockbuster launched its own version of their online movie renting um, that later shifted to what was known as Blockbuster Online, similar to how 
Netflix um, partnered with cellular um, and network uh, companies. Blockbuster partnered with Dish. So again, um, Blockbuster, when Dish was, um, you know, when people bought the Dish kind of TV sets, sorry for lack of a better word, um, or a Blockbuster would be bundled into this. So customers, Dish customers would have access to Blockbuster movies. Um, however, again, going back to that late fee, which was what the main revenue driver was for Blockbuster, they lost over 2 million in late fees because of this online version, um, online streaming version, online mail-in version did away with late fees. Um, this new business venture, it cost 200 million to kind of start up, to partner with Dish. Um, and in total, Blockbuster lost 75% of their total revenue. So in 2000, by 2010, Blockbuster had accumulated $1 billion in debt, um, partnering, launching new business ventures, uh, continuing, continuing to try to remain afloat and compete with Netflix. Um, but again, this ultimately left them filing to bankruptcy. Um, and by 2014, all retail locations were closed, um, but one Blockbuster still remains um, in Oregon. You can actually rent it as an Airbnb. Um, however, but what ultimately led, uh, you know, many people think Netflix just came about, Blockbuster couldn't stay afloat, uh, which is, you know, partially true, um, but Blockbuster's, you know, in inability to innovate technological changes um, that were happening in the environment, they really did not plan for the future, uh, they failed to innovate, um, and then again, they really only had one streaming revenue, and kind of once that went away, once they didn't really have an ability um, to rely on that anymore, um, this is what led to that giant debt um, and Blockbuster ultimately having to close down because they could not pivot in the environment. Um, they couldn't change their business plan. They didn't have that kind of in their design, in their model. So um, kind of quickly uh, cover this, go into much more detail um, in my paper, but kind of the organizational theories um, that I recognized um, going through this case was first um, kind of what classification um, of the schools of thought that they fell under. Um, so the classical um, approach really tells us that or believes that there's really one best way um, to operate. Uh, this one best way leads to greater efficiency. And again, going back to that uh, reven uh, late penalty revenue stream, Blockbuster thought that this would be, uh, you know, would survive throughout time, uh, but ultimately did not. Whereas Netflix, um, I would be, say would be classified as systems theory. The systems theory, um, you know, largely due to um, Hastings and Reed's algorithmic data, um, they were focused on how their subscribers interacted with their website um, and what type of genres um, they were renting. Um, based on the strategic element, um, it played a critical role um, in competing with Blockbuster. And furthermore, I would say I would classify them under the postmodernism and information age theory. Um, which is to overcome challenges that at a given time period presents and focus on technological advances in rapid growth within the organization. Netflix's ability to continuously innovate um, the movie rental industry and serve as a diverse and serve a diverse, diverse customer base, um, I really think would be classified as post-modernism. Um, furthermore, looking at the external environment, um, Big uh, kind of main takeaway here was again, um, the changes in the technological um, sphere. Um, Blockbuster was not able to pivot, um, kind of shift their models, shift directions um, and be successful here where Netflix really continued um, to change their model um, from mail-in to streaming to original content to global expansion in order to continually adapt and change um, within the environment. Um, they really um, operated in a very rich environment, a um, lot of resources, um, large customer base. Um, and then lastly, um, again, in my paper, I take through the organizational life cycle um, stages, um, but really kind of put an emphasis on where Blockbuster failed um, in the elaboration stage. Um, so it's this is, you know, what's really known as kind of the make or break point uh, for an organization. Um, at this point, you know, they're well established in the environment, they kind of reach a peak. Um, and again, whether they um, pivot or not, um, they'll start to see a, a decline um, in Blockbuster at this stage. Um, again, fail to evolve, 
um, failed to move towards uh, streaming technological in technological ways. Um, and kind of once they did, they were really too far behind um, and kind of didn't have, no longer have the financial means um, to keep up. And again, which is what ultimately led to them having to file for bankruptcy and close all store retail store locations. So, um, and lastly, my discussion questions. Uh, so Blockbuster chose late fees as their primary source of revenue. However, this was very hated um, by customers and Blockbuster ignored their customer base. Do you think this was a reliable stream or do you think there was an alternative plan such as increased movie prices, more retail locations, um, et cetera, that would have been better? Uh, do you think if Blockbuster had purchased Netflix, uh, Netflix, or that should be the other way around, if Netflix had purchased Blockbuster, um, Netflix would have been as successful as it was today. Um, did Blockbuster have the platform's resources, management, and willingness to expand? Why or why not? A main reason Blockbuster uh, had to file for bankruptcy was due to change in the environment. What are other pros and cons to change in the environment? Do you think uh, change in the environment is a positive for organization or leads to greater confusion and inefficiency? Uh, number four, a lack of competitive advantage is what ultimately destroyed Blockbuster. Keeping organizational theories in mind were the key elements an organization must consider when evolving in the market. And lastly, both Blockbuster initially and Netflix can attribute their success to innovation, to innovative data information processing systems, DIPs. Um, why is DIPs important to an organization? How do they lead to more inefficiency? Um, is there a possibility of too much information? And kind of what problems could this cause? And so that is the end. Uh, thank you guys. And I look forward to watching, reading everyone else's presentations.